Hello everyone and welcome to the first Q&A for 2024 for the first quarter. Um, my name's Matt, I'm one of the co-founders at Mossy Earth and I'm joined today by my good friends and colleagues Tim um, who heads up our communications and Tom behind the lens uh, from the video team. There he is. So today we're going to look at, um, we're going to address all the questions that we've collated from you guys since the last Q&A. We'll also, uh, we've got a few announcements to share and then we'll finish off with the numbers um, for Q1. Um, a couple of notes, Tim and I have got our mobile phones with us. That's just so we can uh, keep track of questions and our notes. So we're not drifting off while the other one's talking. So it's not a distraction. And you'll also be pleased to know this q and I've got matching socks, unlike the last Q&A, but I come with a terrible haircut. So there we are. <clears throat> and a few more gray hairs, I see as well. <laughs> <laughs> a few more gray hairs indeed. Um, so less about my appearance and let's crack on with the Q&A. Um, we're starting off with the hubs. Yep, so uh, first question um, for you, Matt, is uh, why did you decide to shift your focus towards building your own project hubs instead of just continuing to collaborate with partners? Cool, yeah, that question came through a few times uh, over the last month. So um, actually, since the beginning of Mossy Earth, um, it's been a long time dream that we have our own sort of large land scale um, type projects. And fortunately, because of the support of our members, uh, bigger budgets and a fantastic team that we have, we're sort of able to realize that dream now. Um, but sort of hubs are more than just say a pie in the sky dream. They also enable us to focus on areas um, perhaps where there's little conservation happening at the moment, or it's areas that are large enough that we can really scale up our projects. Um, and it's also um, that we can have sort of, we can be in, in one place for, for the long term, have a sort of long term presence. And those last two sort of points, the long-term presence and scaling up of projects, then creates economies, economies of scale in terms of um, researching projects, planning projects, implementing, monitor, monitoring projects, So, um, which ultimately means we can then be more efficient with our members' funding. Um, in addition to that, if we're somewhere for a long period of time, we can build really sort of deep and long-lasting relationships with uh, all the stakeholders. So um, from landowners, farmers, other associations, outdoor enthusiasts, hunters, and by building all of these relationships, you can then have a sort of domino effect. Um, we saw this with Tiago's project, the invasive um, plant removal event um, that Tiago has been working on for a good three or four years now. And he's managed to sort of mobilize the local climbing community um, and they now know when they're out climbing on their own, which plants are invasive, which ones are, are threatened and, and which, you know, how to protect those plants. So this domino effect is, is uh, really important for our hubs. Um, a couple of other reasons. Um, if you're working in a large landscape scale area, um, you've got this, we can um, create connectivity. So, uh, which is really important in rewilding where previously uh, habitats, ecosystems, or pockets of wildlife were isolated through this idea of connectivity. We can we can try to link them up. Um, it also adds continuity or clearer continuity for our projects. Instead of sort of being spread all over uh, different places, there's a continuity. And also something we'll probably come on to is that if we in, in a hub, if we have our own land, our own infrastructure, or we're able to build our own infrastructure, we can house volunteer, more volunteer events. Uh, we can receive research students, etc. So, yeah, a lot of reasons for the hubs, um, and a few, few more of them I'm sure we'll touch on later in the, in the Q and A. Yeah, yeah. Now I think it's just as you're saying, a good chance for us to sort of build our our uh, presence from the ground up in these yeah really focused areas. Uh, yeah, for for the longevity of, of our work. Yeah. Doing it. No, really exciting. Really exciting. Okay, so moving on to the next question. Um, will you still be open to financing new partner-led projects in the future? Yes, yeah. I mean, over the years, we've built some fantastic relationships with some really fantastic partners, um, which we continue to, we wish to continue working with, and we've got lots of ambitious projects in mind with these partners. Um, the only thing I would say, perhaps we're not going to be opening that up at the same rate as we were in the past, but we are definitely still open to um, partnership projects. Um, so will the selection process uh, for partner-led projects change now that you're more focused on the hubs? Got you. No, the selection remains the same. Um, I mean, at the very sort of essence of project selection is we're trying to um, give the highest environmental return 
on our members' funding. Okay, that's you know the best environmental bang for your buck. That's essentially what it is. Um, there's a lot more to it than that when, when it comes to selection, uh, project selection, and I'd really recommend um, diving into, uh, we've got two methodology pages that sort of, um, you can learn more about how we plan, assess, um, create objectives for our projects, and that's the um, project development protocol and the rewilding methodology pages. So yeah, I really recommend going and checking them. You can have a good dig and perhaps a video team can put those pages um, on the screen. But yeah, selection process remains the same. Great. Um, will the hubs enable you to offer more opportunities for volunteering and student research? I mean, you've touched a bit on this. Yeah, yeah exactly that. I mean, um, again, if we, if we think about Tiago's uh, invasive plant removal project that he created from the ground up. It was like a sort of mini hub, if you like. Um, there's no coincidence that we've had loads of volunteering events there. When it's your own project, it just lends itself to organizing events. And also, um, particularly if we, we have land or we, we have um, uh, land available, whether it's for a private landowner where we can build infrastructure to receive them, then yeah, there's, there's, more, there's more opportunities for this. It's something we're creating in, in Ecuador at the moment, so we can receive research students, volunteers. Uh, so yeah, it just lends itself to it. And it's something we've wanted to do since the beginning of setting up Mossy Earth, but it's it's not as easy as, as one thinks. So yeah. And yeah, I'll touch on that as well um, in one of the upcoming questions too. Cool. Um, now on to uh, the social aspects. Um, if you want to take it from here. From yes, I could, questions and, yeah, yeah, so I could uh, hand the mic over to Tim. So the social aspect of our projects, um, how do you make sure that your projects consider the interests of the local communities and are implemented in line with local regulations? So yeah, to answer this question, um, we, we, we carefully consider the, the, the social and uh, ecological uh, context uh, as a whole. Um, it's um, yeah, something we need to, to help us uh, evaluate the feasibility and, and predict the long-term impact of our projects. Because um, essentially what we're doing is we're targeting the um, the, the funding and the, the the time and effort and the um, on the ground work um, to to find solutions to these complex social and ecological problems, um, and um, you know if there's something that we neglect on this side or if there's a component which we don't fully understand, then you know we risk not um, fully achieving what you know we set out to do um, in terms of impact. So yeah, essentially what I'm trying to say is that these areas are tied together um, and. Um, you know, and it also depends really on, on the, the projects themselves as well. So some projects uh, are very remote and um, there's very little, you know, very few people that will be affected by our interventions, whereas others, um, you know, there's a, a real opportunity to improve the livelihoods of, of the community. Um, but, um, you know, also in the same time, you know, they, they, there's a potential to, to harm uh, livelihoods such as, you know, fisheries and things like that. So. Um, you know what it looks like in terms of our research um, when we're doing our research we we start um, you know the early stages of our project development it, we sort of carefully you know analyze the situation and, and try to understand where the, there is an opportunity for um, community engagement and how we can sort of create real community um, value in the community through our, our, our work um, and in terms of the, the project partnership projects that we that we have um, we ask our partners to sort of outline the the uh, potential for a project to or an intervention to to engage a community um, what which stakeholder groups uh, will be uh, uh, involved in the project and 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 also other sort of cultural considerations um, that's something that you know we we, um, we outline in our management plans um, or any yeah, projects that we fund with those partners um, and then it's also the case of when we're um, when community value is a is a is a key strategy for conservation as well, um, we um, you know we'll we'll really consider um, the the local context and go a step further by you know sort of looking into research and um, working with universities where we can to to get studies done on the um, the impact that you know our projects could have on in the local context. Um, to better understand really you know what the what the challenges and problems and values that these um, people are facing in that situation um, and you know all this sort of research will, will feed into our decision making process and, and, our, and our guide our strategy um, to help us and also uh, help us uh, act as a sort of a, a baseline to, to measure our impact against 
Um, and so, so to give you some sort of concrete examples of, of all this I'm um, talking about, so in, um, you know, on Ecuadorian um, Amazon rainforest project, um, we're looking into hosts, uh, hosting some uh, anthropology students um, from a local university to see yeah, if they can um, say really find out what the, the problems are and the, the values of, of the people that are living in the, in the community in the forest there. Sometimes sort of community engagement and stakeholder engagement can sound like a bit of a tick box exercise, but from my personal experience working, I, I work um, a percentage of my time on the hub here in Portugal. It's actually a really fun and enriching part of of the process you know it, it comes easily it's 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 actually a pleasure to do so it's not like you, one has to do it or it's uh it's a chore it's actually really enjoyable and the the, the rewards are, are evident it's just much easier to to work in an area when when, when you engage with everybody um, and also if, if you haven't got the community behind you you know you can't expect this project to to last in the long term so, yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and it, another point to that is that we, we directly employ um, members of the local community as well. Um, you know, as with this, uh, the project in the um, Yasuni, uh, well, bordering the Yasuni rainforest, um, it was actually Freddie, a, a local member of the Quechua community who reached out to us, mm. you know, needed needed the help, um, wanted to, to protect the, the forest that he grew up in. And and, um, and now, yeah, he's, he's, he's really leading our efforts from the ground there, really, as one of our newest team members. Um, and, um, and yeah, so there's also that, and there's, uh, Scotland as well. We're working closely uh, with um, local community groups there, the Ocean Murray community, um, and uh, also looking into bringing on board uh, some master, master students as well to sort of gather some research um, from the perceptions of the local population there as well and understand you know, the, the restoration that we'll be doing in the marine habitats there. Cool. And just the, the last bit of the question was about local regulations. So there is a lot of bureaucracy, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So um, uh, with all our projects, we the Brentwood uh, permissions and, and licenses uh, before we carry out any work um, and you know in conservation this can often be a lot, lot long drawn out process but uh, you know it's, it's something that's really rewarding when it comes to fru fruition um, as with our most recent um, project that started in the uh, Slovakia with the Chili's Brook uh, restoring or creating new wetland there it's, there was a lot of um, paperwork to to get through there and uh, yeah after about a year of of uh, going through that process, it's uh, great to see the work really get get underway there. Yeah, I definitely think it's it's what takes the longest when setting up a new project, isn't it? Is, is the bureaucracy yeah. <laughs> necessary evil? So your project in Ecuador is quite different from previous projects with its focus on community de development. Is this a direction that you're planning to move more towards as an organisation in the future uh, projects as well? Yeah, our, our main focus is to to use our membership funding as, as uh, wisely as possible and, and to have the greatest impact uh, with those funds um, and uh, you know, have the, the greatest impact on nature so often that um, the, the actions to get to that the, that goal is can vary from project to project um, with our with our land in Portugal sorry in Ecuador we're in Portugal now <laughs> our land in uh, uh, in Ecuador that was um, I mean great impact was already sort of achieved as, as we uh, were just purchased. buying it exactly. right yeah yeah, yeah. So, to, to protect and restore that that part of the um, the Amazon, I think in a nutshell, if if, if, uh, if the community is an, an important rel or important and relevant part of the project, then then um, we we will go down that avenue. But we also have projects where, as Tim mentioned earlier, they're so remote that it really doesn't affect um, too much of a community or very few people, perhaps some outdoor enthusiasts or something like that. So, yeah, it's it's a project by project basis. It's not we're right now we're doing community, or now we're not. It's uh, project by project. I think. Course. The next section, so number seven, I, I can take these, Tim, which is about expanding to other countries and buying more land. Yep. A couple of questions there for me. Okay, so uh, when will you expand your work to more countries and which countries would be next? Okay, uh, so at the moment we're actually super busy. We've got our hands tied with our five hubs, which are Iceland, Portugal, Ecuador, Indonesia and Scotland as well as the existing partnership projects. I think we're at the moment we're running at about running 12 at the moment. So with all this going on and um, really wanting to focus on our hubs at the moment, it's unlikely that we'll open up into a, a new country, certainly this year, perhaps uh, in 2025, if the right opportunity comes up. Because we also want to remain flexible um, as we were in the past, if there is a great opportunity, perhaps there's an underfunded or threatened species, or there's a project where we can have a really um, comparatively, you know, 
big impact for the, for the funding provided, etc. So we are open, but at the moment, no new countries. I mean, incidentally, we're opening a project, um, a partnership project in the autumn in the US. Um, it's not a new country. We have worked in the US before. Um, but yeah, this, this one in the US is a little bigger than what we've done in the past. So no new countries at the moment, but let's see 2025 or 2026. Great. Are you planning to buy more land in the future? Um, buying land, yeah, interesting question. It comes up a lot. Um, so it's not a game of risk. It's not just let's buy, buy, buy. Let's not just buy for the sake of buying. Um, we would only look to buy if it makes sense. So in the case of Ecuador, the opportunity came up through Freddy. Um, and by buying the land, we could um, take it out. It, Otherwise, it could have gotten into the wrong hands. So by buying it, and it was a reasonable price, so it made sense that the land stayed in good hands where we can restore it and we can work with the local community to manage it. That made sense. Um, or in Slovakia, for example, we recently helped our partners Broz buy a small parcel of land that's within the area where our wetland project is. And the reason for that was there's been a change in government and that parcel of land uh, was owned by the government. And if we could put it in, into our name or our partner's name, we could then ensure that it was protected because just recently in Slovakia the new government um, not so environmentally friendly as the last so it was important that so so there again it was only a small parcel of land and it made sense so strategic strategic yeah. exactly or for example let's say here in Portugal um, we're building this hub here if there's a, a, a piece of land needed to um, for for building to store equipment or to house volunteers or to build a nursery if 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 the only way for that to happen is to buy the land, then again, strategically it makes sense. But it's not a case of, yeah, it's not a big game of risk. That's my point. <laughs> How does your work help fight climate change? And to what degree do you consider this when selecting and planning your projects? Uh, well, so our focus is, is, uh, is on improving the, um, the state of uh, the health and longevity of, of ecosystems. Um, and, um, you know, in doing that, we'll be increasing the amount of carbon that's um, or living organisms you know that can capture carbon over time and um, you know essentially make our ecosystems more resilient to climate change um, so yeah I mean this is something we consider in the, in the project selection process um, you know we there are extreme examples of rewilding where um, you know species will be in, introduced to sort of predicted climate uh, temp uh, changes but uh, that's that's not uh, what we're looking into at the moment say so our focus is on mitigation and um, resilience um, you know, it's, it's examples we've already uh, talked about. This, um, you know, the work we're doing in, in the, close to the, the Estony uh, rainforest. You know, the, uh, the conditions there are obviously so, so unique that that it could be you know a ref, a, a, a in, in the Amazon. Scientists have even predicted that um, you know there could be relatively more stable conditions. Um, in current climate scenarios there and you know so you know we're trying to do our bit there really to, to sort of safeguard this the biodiversity in that region um, and then there's also other examples where we you know like in our um, quarry uh, projects uh, rewilding a, a former mining site um, you know we're sort of expanding and diversifying the the water surfaces there and then that will sort of increase the water retention and, and infiltration through the land and that sort of feeds into the Improving the uh, hydrological cycle there, uh, the carbon storage, and, and ultimately uh, build, building sort of resilience of the landscape. Um, and then, um, you know, other, other examples we, we look at um, in Scotland, we're um, increasing the riparian um, tree cover along the water lines there. And, you know, that's, that's uh, something which will help with um, rising water temperatures, which, you know, could be really lethal for the aquatic life there. And then we have other examples of. Um, working in uh, Benin in, in West Africa to, to sort of trial and test the, the use of um, soil engineer termites who are you know um, renowned for sort of um, improving conditions in, in, in the soil and, and, uh, and helping to sort of fend off the, the, the spread of desertification there um, but also in places like Iceland we're, we're still researching there at the moment but uh, we will be looking into areas which which are predicted to, to warm um, and in, in a country like Iceland that you know that could be quite severe so um, yeah it's really about building resilience um, through sort of um, improving the health and strength of the of our, our, our ecosystems. Mm. So yeah broadly speaking you know biodiversity is our focus and 
um, carbon sequestration is just one of the many benefits, isn't it? And in the long yep. term, by building this uh, resilient, you are then actually locking up carbon. So, yeah. Cool. Um, the next question, Tim, why don't you measure Portman in any carbon metrics? So, uh, yeah, as we were saying, you know, uh, we're interested really in, in um, restoring biodiversity and, and uh, functioning ecosystems. So, um, you know, carbon is just a, a single metric and, um, and in terms of uh, measuring that you know the state of nature it's uh, it's not a good metric for us that's you know we'd, we'd be best to sort of look into to spending our time and resources into monitoring um, other components of a, of a of a project that you know really reflect what we're doing in a more appropriate way so you know as I say carbon um, it, if, I, if, if, if I can jump in because I was yeah. talking to a couple of our biologists recently they're actually you know it comes at a cost monitoring comes at a cost both financially and time um, and where we have such a wide range of projects, uh, well, some even don't even sequester carbon, but those that do, you would have different monitoring techniques for each of these different yeah, projects. Exactly. And then suddenly you've got to ask the question, all of the, that time and financial resources of our, bi our biologists uh, monitoring carbon could be put elsewhere to improve biodiversity. So I found that quite interesting. And another point they made was that projects or project types where it's easy to monitor carbon metrics there would also be many other players already there yeah, exactly and then it makes no sense that we're also there as well so there's a lot of money going into projects where carbon metrics are easy to so yeah that, 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 so, yeah i mean there's there's a long range of um, really exciting opportunities to, to, to restore nature um, um, but yeah say are you know that more in line with our broader goals of restoring nature rather than just sort of focusing on carbon sequestration. <laughs> so we're now moving on to a new topic, which is uh, about our upcoming course, uh, rewilding course, which we're about to uh, release. Um, so yeah, tell us more about that, Matt. And um, the, one of the questions that we've got is, why did you decide to invest in creating a rewilding course? Sure, so yeah, it's uh, long overdue the course, um, but we hope to launch it soon. Um, and the reason we launched it was we get so many questions. Um, typically, I've just become a member, but how else can I get involved personally um, in my local area or how can I get more involved in nature? So we built a course, it starts with the foundations of rewilding, but then is, is sort of acts as um, a pathway to action. So people are empowered, they've got the confidence, knowledge to go out and do things in their local area, get involved politically or start volunteering or setting up their own project or rewilding their garden, for example. So, so yeah. a lot, yeah, a lot in there then to, to unpack. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, and yeah, can you tell us maybe a bit more about who the course is uh, meant for and, and, and you know, what one could learn from it? Sure. Um, so yeah, perhaps someone new or newish to rewilding. Um, and and in, that, in those first modules, they can, as I say, get the sort of principles of rewilding, but then also somebody that wants to get actively involved um, and perhaps lack the um, confidence or knowledge or where to start looking um, so they can get involved in their local area. And I, I made a list of, um, because it's um, five modules um, and I can just read out some of sort of the content in each mod module. So um, kicking off with sort of understanding the key ecological processes that are fundamental to rewilding, such as succession, trophic cascade, functional connectivity, nutrient cycling, keystone species, and a systems thinking approach. Um, learners can identify examples of both passive and active approach approaches to rewilding and evaluate the common constraints to ecological restoration. They can also um, be able to value ecosystems, interpret biodiversity metrics, uh, and also be able to assess scientific evidence. Um, then the second module looks more at sort of rewilding your own space, so whether that's a windowsill, a balcony, a garden, or perhaps some people have, you know, a couple of hectares of land. Um, then if they want to go beyond sort of a small garden, they could look at setting up their own rewilding project. Um, module three touches on how to pursue a career in the rewilding space or how to get um, involved sort of in terms of volunteering or researching in, in, in the space. Then we move on to um, module four, which is about citizen science, how people can get involved when they're out and about in citizen science or perhaps even create their own citizen science project. Um, and then the final one looks at how one can get involved politically. So writing to your local MP or setting up a petition or perhaps organizing a demonstration or how best to vote when it comes to, to, to voting in, in one's country. So yeah, loads in there. Um, yeah. I'm really excited for it to launch. Wow, yeah, it sounds really exciting. And um, yeah, really broad range of topics covered there. And and uh, this, uh, this, this, this moment in time, really, it's, it's great to see the rewilding movement sort of 
growing, going from strength to strength, and, and really hopefully this this course can enable a lot of people to, to get out there and, and feel more empowered, as you say. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, a lot of appetite for it. Great. Um, so yeah, moving on to uh, well, the, the specifics on the, uh, the the cost of the course, etc. So how much does the course cost, and um, why can't you offer it for free? Someone's asked. Sure, yeah. sure. Um, so it's um, it's ninety nine pound ninety nine uh, pounds for members and one hundred nineteen pounds for non members. Um, and the reason it's not for free is it took a lot of um, financial resources to create the course and we didn't feel it was fair that we're taking that money from the membership pot. Um, so by charging for the course, we believe that the course can then pay for itself in the long term. But of course, if anybody genuinely can't afford the course and they've got this appetite for rewilding, then they can contact us and we can give the course for free. Wow, yeah. Um, so uh, contact us, uh, the team email, is that right? The yeah, or oh, there's a there's a course at mossy.earth, but when the course launches, um, that'll all become come available. It'll also be there on the the course page. So. Great, that's cool. Um, and then yeah, in terms of the future of the um, Mossy Earth education, so to speak, um, are we planning to create uh, more courses in the future? Yeah, so um, I was a big part of the course um, and have an educational background, so I'm really keen to launch other courses and have a list of. Um, really exciting ideas coming up, but let's get this one launched. Let's see how it goes. Um, get over any teething problems of launching a course because it's the first time we've ever done this. And then perhaps after that, we, we launch a, a few more. Great. Um, okay, thanks. Over to you then. Yeah, All so right. there's, there's a couple sort of miscellaneous questions to end with. Um, this one for you, Tim. Where can I learn more about the science behind your projects? Okay, yeah, so yeah, we do get a lot of members that um, uh, really want to know more about the, the science uh, behind our, our projects, um, which is really exciting to, to know that, yeah, there's that enthusiasm. So we, we do our best to try and um, present the, uh, the information or make it easy for you to, to find out how we, um, we build science into our, our projects. Um, and say so the best place to start is our project pages. Uh, from there, you can download our management plans. And within those plans, we um, we explain the, uh, the scientific rationale behind our interventions. Um, there's a table where we have our key assumptions and uh, any evidence, you know, to support that. Um, I mean, although we don't go into sort of the highest level of uh, thoroughness for for every single project, there are there should be enough there in in each um, management plan for you to sort of assess and and, and uh, evaluate and, and come judge for yourself. You know, the, the information that we we we've, we've used. Um, to, to, to back our plans. Um, then in terms of uh, science, it, it makes sense to mention our partnership, um, which we have close partnership with uh, the um, conservation evidence from uh, Cambridge University. Um, they're helping us to develop our uh, approach to integrating uh, evidence into our projects and decision making. And, um, and also uh, helping us to set up some sort of carefully designed, well thought out tests as well that we can we can really sort of test what works and what doesn't work in uh, in rewilding and um, and uh, yeah that's that's a uh, for, for all that information I'd, I'd recommend going to our methodologies as well we have a specific methodology on our partnership with the uh, conservation evidence there um, and as I say check out the, the project pages and management plans and the the, the con conservation evidence uh, partnership with the with the University of Cambridge um, we may or may not have talked about it on other um, other Q and A's, um, and there's also a, a methodology page about it, isn't there? But it, for me, it's just super exciting. So it's where organisations, any learnings from their projects, um, they are put into like a database that, that Cambridge has there, so that other organisations, that if they're doing a project for the first time, they can look at other organisations that have already done something like it and see if there is evidence there that it works or it doesn't. I think it, yeah, I think yeah. It, I think it's brilliant. Um, so yeah, re that's that's a really exciting yeah. part. Um, so just one more point on, on, on science actually there's um, there's also I mean we we've, we've recently uh, emailed uh, mm. you guys about it which is uh, our uh, exciting new uh, rewilding innovation program as well um, so we're essentially we're, we're going to be using a um, or plan to, to use uh, a small percentage of the the, the membership funds five percent um, at the moment um, to to promote try and promote and, and test uh, new innovative uh, ways of, of rewilding um, and also to sort of to test uh, concrete actions or interventions that already exist um, and uh, yeah the idea is to, to sort of try and find scalable solutions really 
uh, in, in through innovation. So yeah, have a look in your, your inbox if you haven't already. Um, but uh, we've already got a lot of great responses uh, in terms of uh, we've asked for your feedback on, on the, this early stage of the, the, the program to, um, to incorporate your feedback. Um, and some, yeah, some great uh, feedback already come through that I've heard from uh, Tiago, uh, who, who's going to be running the program. So uh, yeah, check your inbox if you haven't already and uh, yeah, give us, let us know your thoughts. Yeah, and I think a, a real credit to Tiago and Ellie who are working on this um, innovation program. Um, it was their brainchild. Um, I think it's a brilliant idea because from what I've seen in the short time Mossy Earth has been in the sort of area of conservation and rewilding is that there isn't um, as much experimenting as perhaps in other industries or other sectors um, because funding is limited, perhaps organizations don't want to experiment, they'd rather sort of go with something safe. So this grant actually sort of um, unlocks the shackles if you like. People can take this grant from us and try something new and some may fail but others, you know, it might be a game changing um, technology or technique that they that, that they uncover. So I'm really excited for, for this and it just sort of adds another string to the bow which I think is, is, is fascinating. So cool. Um, next question. Oh, that's for, for me actually. I, I can read it. Um, now that the membership is growing, why don't you reduce the percentage of funds that is used to cover Mossy Earth's running costs? So that's referring to the 20%. Uh, 80% goes to impact, 20% goes to the running costs of Mossy Earth, so, so non-project related costs. And while we would like to reduce that 20%, it's we're still not big enough at the moment. Um, and sort of to give an example, just recently as Mossy Earth grew, um, proportionally um, spending on things like insurances and legal fees, all the boring stuff actually increased as well. So um, we do hope to reduce that 20%, but at the moment we're just not yet big enough to start reducing it. Okay. Um, next question is for you, you, Tim. You don't offer many opportunities for volunteering on the ground, but what about opportunities to help the team with non-project related work? Okay, um, yeah, so as you mentioned earlier, Matt, firstly that yeah, we will, would, would like to, to offer more opportunities to volunteer on the ground, um, through our, mainly through our hubs um, going forward. But um, in terms of um, the non-project related opportunities, um, yeah, to be honest, it's, uh, it's been something that's been quite tricky for us to manage until now. Um, and, and there's always that sort of being, the opportunities are generally uh, temporary in nature. So there's, um, there's been that trade off really of, of uh, you know, our t drawing our time and resources to sort of manage these opportunities. Um, and um, yeah, but, um, yeah, up until now, I think yeah, it's, it's just not been something that's been uh, very efficient, maybe on our part, uh, by no fault of its own. But um, at some point, yeah, I'm sure we will have more opportunities, maybe more permanent basis. Uh, but uh, yeah, for now, that's uh, it's it's just um, tricky to manage, I'd say. Sure. Yeah. I mean, we, we are a small team, and we're often an overstretched small team. Um, and in the past, when we have had this, sometimes perhaps people's enthusiasm, they think that they can um, give 10 hours a week or um, 20 hours a month, for example. And, and after a few weeks, this sort of diminishes and it's no fault, fault of their own people, are, people are enthusiastic, but also they've got their own lives. And from our investment of time training people up, um, the output wasn't, um, didn't sort of correlate. But as, as Tim said, it is something we would like to offer. And when we do have a position, it would be on our jobs page. We have a jobs page on the website and that would list any volunteering opportunities, any internship opportunities and any job opportunities. Great. Nice. Um, I believe that is all the questions. Um, and then there's um, a couple of other points just to sort of, so these were the announcements at the beginning of the Q and A. I said we had a couple of announcements. So the first one is merchandise. So. Um, since Mossy Earth launched in 2017, we are always asked about Mossy Earth merchandise. Um, and for a long time, we haven't had it. Uh, one, just we've been busy with, with so many other things. And two, we were, yeah, we were sort of this um, wondering, is, is it sustainable? Do we need more things on the planet? But at the same time, um, there's high demand for it. And also, rather than somebody buying a T-shirt from Primark, a, a Mossy Earth one, we found a really um, great supplier, sustainable and ethical supply in T-Mill. I'm really excited the way they work. They share common goals as us in terms of um, the environment and transparency. So yeah, watch this space shortly for a range of merchandise um, available to the members and the public. 
And then another one um, related to Tom behind the camera actually is last month we, um, we reached 500,000 um, subscribers on YouTube. So yeah, um, <laughs> round of applause for the video team. Um, they work really hard behind the scenes. Um, and yeah, it, 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 it's a landmark achievement and the more subscribers we have, um, the more exposure we have, which then sort of ultimately perhaps more members, bigger project budgets and essentially ultimately bigger impact on the ground. Um, but I'd also like to take this opportunity to ask a big favour. When you look at the YouTube statistics, only 70% um, or 70% of people that watch our videos are not subscribed. So if you are a regular viewer and you've not subscribed, um, just a, a favour to hit the subscribe button next time you're, you're watching. Um, so yeah, any other points you may or may not have forgotten before we move on to the financial report? No, um, yeah, just to reiterate, that was yeah, what an amazing achievement. And um, yeah, really want to thank everybody for following our journey from, from whenever you, you began um, following our, our YouTube channel. But um, yeah, we couldn't do it without your support. So um, yeah, massive thank you. Um, and then other than that, no, I think it's onto the report, isn't it? Yes, so we'll finish with some, some numbers. Um, for this first quarter of 2024. So it's begun um, positively, building on the, the membership base we've had in the past, which again, more members, more impact on the ground, essentially. Um, and since January, we've had 586 new members joining our community. So here I'll be reading a little bit because it's, it's all numbers and I think I have a bit of number dyslexia. <laughs> so 586 new members joined our community since January. Um, at the beginning of January, we had 12,000 112 and we finished March with 12,698 members um, and to sort of give you an idea 95% of those are just individuals um, like Tim and I both of I both Tim and I are members um, and 5% of those are business memberships um, we're actually often asked what is a business membership so that's where um, the boss of a company may buy um, an individual membership for each employee so they have a sort of individual membership for each employee um, and that sort of um, equates to growth um, of 4.84% 4. 4 for, for this quarter. Um, what does that mean in money available? So the, the raising equates to £394,184.84 towards our projects um, which is a 40% increase from the same time last year where it was where it was at 281,034 pounds and 28 pence. So yeah, a, a, an extra, almost an extra 200,000 since this time last year going towards our projects. 86.8% um, of that comes from the monthly memberships. 9.7% of that comes from yearly memberships. 1.8% comes from gifts. And then 1.7% comes from our fund extra. So that's within the membership account um, you as members can fund extra projects if there's particular project projects you like um, and that is um, at the moment Aspen restoration, Iceland reforestation, wet sedge meadows, kelp restoration, rewilding a quarry and our oyster boat um, and those projects in the fund extra sort of rotate I'd say every three months because um, some they you know they reach the limit um, that reach the budget limit and we also change them to keep things interesting in there um, so the final usable um, membership or the usable revenue from the membership of this quarter is £378,331.36. So that's slightly lower than the 394000 I just mentioned, but we have to take into consideration um, taking away processing fees. And there's also some intricacies of yearly and gift memberships, which you can read more about um, in the Q1 report, which will be sent out in an email. So what does that mean for impact? So remember, 80% goes to impact. So that's £302,665.09 will go to um, impact. So that's assigned for rewilding projects and the project management costs of those projects. Running costs, so that's the 20% I mentioned we were talking about earlier, um, which we would like to reduce, but it's it's 20% at the moment. Um, and that is non-project related um, costs. So salaries for non-project related staff. So web development, operations, accounting, um, those types of things. And that's at £75,666.27. Um, if you're curious to know what these expenses are, both for the... Um, 
for the impact and for the running costs, you can have a look in our transparency dashboard. Um, so yeah, I didn't want to bombard you with numbers. The um, Q1 report that Tim will be sending out in an email goes into a bit more detail. Um, and of course, if you have any questions about that report, email back and we can answer those. Um, but yeah, as I, as I was sort of um, reflecting on these numbers, these last couple of days in preparation for the Q&A, I just think, wow, how far we've come. I remember Duarte and I um, sort of sitting, waiting, refreshing the page when the first member or members came in. And now we've got over 12,000. So um, it's, it, it's really amazing. Um, so I'd like to, yeah, really take that opportunity to thank you as members um, for supporting us and also the fantastic work the team um, does at Mossy Earth. Because, yeah, without your support and their hard work, yeah, none of this would be possible. So Yeah, no, I'd, I'd say echo everything you say there and, and also that um, I think we've, we sort of noticed that we, we have a really nice core of members as well that have been with us for, you know, a long time now. And uh, yeah, it's really great to, to, to sort of have that um, regular support and, you know, knowing that, that you're backing our projects and everything we're doing um, with such enthusiasm as you do. Uh, so, yeah, thank you. Yeah, what, in fact, one of our... First members um, and good friend Matt Trinder, he even appears on the course. He got involved in, in the, the course, so you'll you're see him in there. So yeah, um, I think, um, yeah, cheers for this time and we'll see you for Q2 um, in three months time. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, Tim. See ya. Cheers, Tom. <laughs>